Uh, executive session ran about 15 minutes long, so we're running about 15, we're starting running about 15 minutes behind. Um, anyone have any announcements? Well, I, I was, uh, I'm sorry Mr. Cirillo isn't here, but I would like to say I was delighted to see in our... Later, by the way, but is he going to be here later? Yeah, Should I? Well, I, I want to I wanna, uh, credit uh, Steve Cirillo, our town uh, treasurer and director of the finance department, and you, Mr. Kleckner, and Ms. Goff, and Mr. Faison, the entire team, um, that the town has once again been issued a, a AAA bond rating by Moody's. Um, this is so important for us as we do so many of these large projects, and I always explain it to people. It's like, you know, if you're able to go out and get a mortgage at a very favorable rate rather than a much higher rate, the amount you have to pay um, for your, to get your buildings built um, is so much better with the AAA bond rating. So I, I am thrilled to see this, and I, I thank everyone uh, for their continued budget discipline, which, which has gotten us this now for quite a number of years. Yeah, and this is especially important as we have a number of large uh, building projects uh, coming up uh, uh, that we're going to be financing the most. Uh, uh, the, the first is the Devotion School, which should be coming up, uh, I guess, next year for uh, financing. And then uh, we have future uh, school projects uh, in the works, so it's it's important that we keep our uh, uh, bond rating uh, at the most favorable uh, rate. Um, I'll just mention the uh, the Teen Center Gala, which was uh, quite lovely and I'm sure raised uh, a lot of money, which is the, the whole point of it. And uh, that was last Saturday. That was a lovely time. Uh, anyone else? Have anything? I, I just wanted to update the board on uh, uh, on the progress that the uh, the River Road Study Committee, a group that we convened now, I think two months ago, uh, has made um, in recent weeks. So um, the committee is now up and running. Uh, the full group has met, I believe, twice, uh, and various subcommittees are gathering to sort of go through the process and um, and adjudicate, try and figure out. Uh, what the community wants to see uh, built, what types of uses, how tall, the massing uh, on the industrial parcel uh, that runs uh, along Brookline Avenue uh, at the intersection of Brookline Avenue and, um, and Washington Street Route 9. So uh, know that things are happening. Um, there's been robust participation from the public um, and uh, happy to answer any questions that, uh, that any of you have uh, either tonight or uh, in the future as the process unfolds. Selectman Green? Yeah, I'd like to just uh, mention that uh, last uh, Wednesday, I attended a conference at the uh, Harvard School of Education sponsored by the um, U.S. Attorney's Office on the topic uh, school to prison pipeline and how to address issues uh, that uh, occur in the uh, schools as well as elsewhere uh, that uh, uh, result in a number of uh, students, particularly uh, students of color, um, uh, being pushed into a uh, pipeline to jail, basically. Uh, one of the things I want to just mention there is that uh, a speaker at the uh, uh, conference uh, gave a, a nice shout out to Brookline, uh, Brookline Police and the schools for the manner in which uh, we intervene uh, with kids at risk to uh, provide advocates for them as well as provide uh, alternatives to the criminal justice system when they do things that kids do and that you know many of us did when we were young, uh, but which uh, in, in today's zero tolerance world uh, have been criminalized. Um, so you know, that shout out to Brookline I think should be um, you know, known widely because of uh, the work that we've, we're doing counter to a lot of uh, the problems that are being created in other communities with respect to this issue. Can so I just Dillon. add to that that, uh, that that some of that intervention comes through the round table, that mm -hmm. the, the police, the high school guidance counselors, probation officers, and uh, do um, meeting at, at um, our courthouse across the street. And one of the reasons that um, that, that sort of level of cooperation, mm -hmm. which I think has been pretty effective in diverting kids who might otherwise be, get into more serious trouble, 
um, is one of the reasons we have fought so hard to keep that courthouse open mm -hmm. and, and periodically um, this arises in the state budget as something I mean it's it's ironic because if you if you are successful at um, at diverting uh, kids from getting into trouble you have fewer cases being heard at the the courthouse and then they cite those statistics when they tell us well we should close this courthouse so it's it's um uh, but you know I think it's it's more cost effective for the town and mm -hmm. the Commonwealth to um, divert kids and keep them out of that because um, it's it's I mean just in it's certainly costly in terms of their lives but it's very costly I think monetarily mm -hmm. also when kids um, you know get get into more serious troubles so anything else do we have anyone signed up for public comment okay <coughs> Ms. Frawley uh, just when you're done just sign up and we know who you are, so. You know who are you? Yep. <laughs> Five are you minutes. talking to me? <laughs> Hi, um, Regina Frawley, Tammany member from 16 and the coordinator for the South Brookline Senior Social. I was planning to speak to our program next week, but it turned out we had a bonus. And the bonus is that the Baker School on Thursday night, the 17th, is the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders are doing production of The Lion King. And I would like any seniors in Brookline to give me a call. We have access to 40 tickets that will be gratis for seniors. So give me a call at 617-469-0052, and I'll arrange to be there enough to pass it out, uh, the tickets, but give me a call. It, uh, we're such a wonderful program that we're getting calls to give us things, and that's always a good thing. Having said that, the week after that, we're starting our spring socials. And we have the kickoff will be the um, cookout provided by the Recreation Department. That's March 25th, I think that is. I apologize uh, for the date and any conflict with people's religious observance. Uh, we had originally gone for April 1st and that wasn't available for this event. So 25th of March will be the cookout. After that, we'll have programs with yoga by the health department. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the police department will come and talk about different uh, things going on vis-a-vis -vis elders in the uh, department. We have the senior center coming for a, a program that they're doing that might be of interest to seniors. And uh, who knows what else we'll be doing in uh, our program. And here's the real bonus for those who seem to passionately love yoga. The health department is so excited about the senior yoga and how well it's been received and people really appreciate it. They are uh, expanding their sponsorship for a total of eight weeks this spring. So it's everything we do is free. There's no charge for it. And just give me a call at the 469-0052 and I'll make sure that there's a hot dog or a hamburger for you or whatever. Um, it's important because out of courtesy, we don't want to have them bring more than they, right. than we need. So and so we, and a lot of our seniors will not be in town. And I do want to add to the previous announcement that the good thing, one of the many good things about seniors is we do not use the police services and the courthouse very much at all. So, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ms. Frawley. We've got, um, we've got some changes. Yeah. Okay, so anyone else wish to speak? Just uh, sign up and uh, Mike Stanley. I uh, live in a package corner just across the street from the Brook Line. Could, could you get it to the mic because you're on TV? Okay. <coughs> Over there. Over there. Okay. Five minutes. Uh, it will be one minute. Um, okay. So I'm Mike Stanley with uh, Transit X. I'm a, a resident of uh, Alston across from uh, Brookline. And we're doing a, uh, and I'll be talking to the transportation board as well, but we're doing a uh, carbon-free mass transit system. 
And so this is to replace cars, buses, trains, and trucks uh, in urban settings. So think about uh, what you have for the uh, uh, B line on Comab and how that's different than the B line from Kenmore Square to Boston College. So now imagine that you can have a green space like you would have um, in the Back Bay, but along uh, route. So imagine uh, something like you see sort of in the, in the video there, if you can, uh, ultra lightweight, personalized, uh, automated vehicles. And so um, just wanted to say I'll, I'll be sort of making a proposal. This is a privately funded, um, low cost mass transit system. And uh, I think Brookline would be, fits the right demographic and the right um, so we're talking to Boston, we have letters of support. Uh, City of Chelsea has uh, done a, a letter of interest for the system, and we have letters of support from the, both of the senators, uh, Markey and uh, Warren, as well as um, Cambridge, uh, Watertown, um, Belmont, and Arlington. So I'd like to sort of uh, talk to Brookline, and, and uh, I'll, I'll start with the transportation side, yeah. but I'm sure at some point- Yeah, the transportation have... board would be the place yeah. to start. But thank so, you very much. Thank you. Well, good luck. Yeah, good luck. Sounds very interesting. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, so let's move on to our miscellaneous calendar. The first item is the minutes of March 1st. I have a couple of items, as does Selectman Daly and Green. I made some edits as well. All those in favor of the minutes of March 1st as amended, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Selectman Green. Aye. And chair votes aye. I'll just uh, mention that uh, Selectman Heller is a bit under the weather. She may be joining us remotely um, as we move along in our agenda. Um, next item is the question of approving a change order in the amount of $5,029 for work performed by Shulman Design and Construction in connection with the Devotion School Additions and Renovations Project. Mr. Bennett. I'll handle this for Tony. He's downstairs at a building commission meeting. Um, this uh, change order is for an as-built uh, field survey by Shulman Construction of all the floors of the existing 1913 building for Devotion. That will assist in the construction and making sure um, all the new floors in the uh, new wings match up and everything aligns properly. Yeah, I will say that the, these are, Shamit's our construction manager at risk, and they have been working very hard to make sure we don't have unpleasant surprises that lead to large change orders down the road. So I think this is part of that effort. Okay, any other questions or comments? Therefore, I'll move that we approve change order number two in the amount of $5,029 for work performed by Shomit Design and Construction, connection with the Devotion School Additions and Renovations Project. All those in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Selectman Green. Aye. Chair votes aye. Next item is the question of authorizing re the reprogramming of prior year CDBG funds from various accounts in the amount of $237,484 and 90 cents. Had to get that 90 cents in there to the Gateway <laughs> East project. Mr. Viola. Good evening. Joe Viola, Assistant Director for Community Planning. Um, yes, we respectfully request that the board uh, approve the reprogramming of our prior year CDBG funds um, and the placement of those funds into the Gateway East project fund to, to fund the project's re revised design budget. Um, as noted in the memorandum that went along with this request, the uh, transfer of the CDBG funds from closed projects to active projects is actually a, a pretty common housekeeping practice, and we've done it numerous times over the years. Um, staff is recommending that all the town's prior year CDBG funds be consolidated and, and obligated to an existing CDBG uh, project that's one, in need of funding, and two, um, can utilize the funding in a timely manner. Uh, with respect to Gateway East, uh, it's a project that I'm, I'm sure many of you or all of you are familiar with. Um, at this point, it certainly has a, a need for an infusion of funding. Uh, as the board knows, we've had a, a number of coordination meetings with MassDOT over the past year. We've also had a, a number of uh, public meetings. Um, and the, uh, during those public meetings, we revisited, revisited the overall design to uh, determine if uh, we were making the, the 
the best case we could for pedestrian and bicycle accommodation. Um, so we received a lot of helpful comments from the public. We received a lot of helpful comments from the transportation board. And uh, we really would like to get back to work and refining the current plan so we can meet our funding year obligations. So th this is basically the bill um, for revisiting the design uh, to better accommodate uh, bicycles and uh, pedestrians. Uh, while it's, uh, uh, it's, it's been over 200,000 that were of, of our own money, or actually it's federal block grant money, um, what we're getting out of this is a uh, additional uh, state funding to cover the construction costs of those bicycle and pedestrian improvements. So it's kind of a good return on investment, plus the state required us to do it. <laughs> So, uh, but 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 uh, more important than my flip uh, comment uh, is that uh, this is going to be, I believe, the first uh, separated uh, bike track in uh, Brookline. So uh, to me, that's very exciting, and it's in an area that's kind of dangerous for bicycles. Um, so it'll be good to, to have the separation. So. Dovetailing on that that comment about the uh, the importance of the cycle tracks, um, there have been a number of changes in the Gateway East area. Uh, mm -hmm. Most notably, I spoke about this at the beginning of the meeting. Um, the property at 25 Washington Street, right at the intersection of Brookline Avenue and um, and Washington Street, uh, Route 9, mm -hmm. uh, the use has changed. It is no longer a service station. Um, it's my understanding that the extension of the now planned cycle tracks um, was unable to extend that, that one block down to the riverway down towards Boston because of that service station use. Uh, I'm wondering if this uh, new contract with VHB is going to position us to potentially extend the, the, the cycle track that one additional block should the issues with the current property owner 25 Washington Street be worked out. Absolutely. In the, in in the July meeting we had with the transportation board, that question was posed directly to the designer. We're certainly, uh, VHB is aware of the change in ownership and it, it sort of represents a, you know, a, a timely opportunity for the town to, to explore uh, perhaps getting a right of way easement uh, to accommodate. That was one of the areas in the corridor we, we, couldn't, we couldn't accommodate uh, a protected bicycle lane. Uh, it's definitely on their uh, in their scope of work to to review those areas and other areas where we could we could do more than just uh, you know striping bicycle lanes. So absolutely. So clearly, there's some some work that still needs to be done with the property owner. Um, there's some legal and technical details that have to be worked out. But mm -hmm. it sounds to me as though we're going to be in a position to potentially move forward should those issues be be worked through. Yes. Any other questions or comments from the board? Um, therefore, I'll move that we authorize the reprogramming of prior year CDBG funds from the various accounts in the amount of $237,484.90 to the Gateway East Project. All those in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Selectman Green. Aye. And the chair votes aye. And related to this is uh, approval of the actual contract so we can spend the money. Um, so I'm going to move that we approve and execute a contract amendment and extension between the town and VHB for engineering services in support of the Gateway East project. All those in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Selectman Green. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, next item is the question of approving and executing an agreement for sublease and amendment to the prime lease, prime lease extension and single family dwelling lease for the property located at 29 Avon Street. Mr. Bennett. Yes, so we're requesting uh, approval of this, um, this lease. It will expire in November of 2016. Uh, this is the same um, family, a trust that has been there for at least the past 15 years. Part of their original lease was for them to do $300,000 worth of improvements to the property. Over that time, uh, Charlie Simmons and his uh, division has verified that this work has been completed. Um, uh, Brian Austin's mother passed away. Uh, she no longer lives at the property. As part of this uh, five-year extension, 
they do have the ability to sublease the property. So that's what we're looking for is this approval. And again, it'll expire in November 2016, at which time we will uh, put an RFP out to uh, rent this property, property as we do all of our others. So why, why do we own a single family house? This is a single family, it's part of the Lars Anderson estate. Ah, okay. And this portion of the property is actually in Boston. So in addition to them doing all the improvements, they pay the water, the sewer, and the taxes, which is about $10,000 a year to the city of Boston. Okay, because, uh, okay. I had the same reaction and I tortured Charlie with uh, giving me a, uh, an explanation via email. So please thank Charlie for being patient with me. <laughs> we own about three or four single family dwellings around town. Right, that okay. We so I will, any other questions or comments? I will therefore move that we approve and execute an agreement for sublease, an amendment to the prime lease and prime lease extension and single family dwelling lease for the property located at uh, 29 Avon Street. All those in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Selectman Green. Aye. And chair votes aye. Thank we, you. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Um, we have a bunch of temporary uh, uh, wine, malt, and beverage licenses, and I'll uh, note for the record that uh, the police department has uh, reviewed them all and uh, sees no reason to deny them. I'll take a motion, an omnibus motion for the whole bunch of them. This is going to be a fair amount of reading. So moved. <laughs> So I'll, I'll just list the, uh, well, it's a, I'll go through it. <laughs> uh, wine, wine, malt, and beverage license, the Olive Connection, uh, in connection with the following events, be held at 1426 Beacon Street, a Spanish cuisine tasting, March 10th, uh, 6 to 7.30, and a private event, April 5th, 6 to 8. Um, a wine and malt beverage license to Art Bond for a gala to be held uh, on March 19th at Helena College, uh, 6 to 10, 50 Goddard Avenue. Uh, uh, all kinds temporary to Vine Ripe Grill uh, for a hockey breakup dinner hmm. to be held on March 19th, um, <laughs> 4 to 7 at 1281 West Roxbury Parkway. Uh, a wine and malt temporary to Puppet Showplace Theater connection with the Puppet Slam on March 19th from 8 to 11 at 32 Station Street, and uh, Pine Manor College in connection with <coughs> events uh, at 400 Heath Street Wine and Malt dinner event June 24th from 5 to 8, and at All Kinds Alcohol for a birthday party June 26th, 5 to 10. All those in favor, please say aye, Selectman. Can, can we make comments before we vote? By all means, okay. uh, Selectman. Well, one of the uh, uh, companies we're uh, voting to uh, provide a uh, wine and malt alcohol and beverage license to is uh, Spanish Quiz is the uh, Olive Connection, which, as I think you all know, is a new business in town right up the street from where I live. Um, it's, it's a really great business. They sell quality olive oils. Um, that are properly labeled, which is a real problem uh, in this world. Um, and uh, I just want to give a shout out to that business. I, I know them. Um, I mean, I, I know them because I live near them. Uh, and um, I, want to, I want to uh, uh, say that you know, I really appreciate what they're doing here in town. Okay. Anyone else want to do a commercial for the railroad <laughs> business? Unpaid, by the way. <laughs> They don't even know I did getting that. getting a quart of olive oil at his house. <laughs> <laughs> all those in favor of all those temporary wine and all kinds of alcohol, et cetera, as, as read by me, <laughs> <laughs> please say aye, Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Selectman Green. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Okay, so uh, we're now on to the main calendar. We're only 10 minutes late. So we made up five minutes. Um, the first item is uh, Assistant Director for Community Planning, Joe Viola and Judy Barrett of RKG Associates will appear to provide an update with respect to the housing production plan and community process. And select. Hi. 
and Selectman Heller is joining us uh, remotely. I've uh, uh, I've read the appropriate uh, script. <coughs> Mr. Viola. Good evening, Joe Viola, Assistant Director for Community Planning. Uh, I'm actually, I just wanted to say thank you for allowing us some time on your agenda this evening as we uh, look to have a discussion about the town's housing production plan process. I actually would like to turn the microphone over to Roger Blood, Chair of the Housing Advisory Board, and also a, a, a member of our HPP Working Committee. Uh, he wants to say a few words and, and introduce our consultant team. And also wanted to acknowledge <coughs> Linda Hamlin, who's also on our <laughs> that was in the flag, so. so with that, I'll turn it over to Roger. Mr. Blood, welcome. Good evening. Thank you. Um, well, we miss Selectman Heller this evening. and if she, she, She's here. Oh, well. Well. Oh, well, hello, Nancy. Um, because Nancy, as you know, I'm Selectman here. Heller was the... Good evening. Hello. Uh, as you know, she was the co-sponsor of, uh, of a town meeting article in, this, in the spring that triggered the process that we're about to give you a little update and introduce our consultant. And um, for as much the benefit of folks that may be listening as, as you all who have maybe heard a bit of this before, I might take just a, a few moments to, to give you the, a, a little background. Um, in the, at the spring town meeting, um, town meeting passed, I think it was unanimous, Article 17, which in part said <clears throat> that the Housing Advisory Board and the Planning Board are requested by town meeting to take advantage of available planning tools to ensure that Brookline makes progress towards its afford affordable housing goal in a manner that optimizes the town's opportunity to secure a Chapter 40B safe harbor status, including through the development of a housing production plan. Uh, and that the plan will be acceptable to the Commonwealth's 40B uh, regulators and also that the plan is, is sensitive to the integrity of existing residential properties and neighborhoods. Um, the follow-up to, to town meeting's request began with the formation of a housing production plan working group, which consists of two members each from the HAB and the planning board, including both chairs. Uh, who are here tonight, and four planning board staff members, including the uh, department director, Allison Steinfeld, and two individuals from the department's housing uh, division. Uh, the working group uh, developed and disseminated a uh, request for proposals to uh, assist the town with its housing production plan, and responses were received and reviewed uh, in early fall. Uh, two finalists were interviewed, and one selected, who you, whom you're going to meet the, tonight, uh, was selected by the group. Um, our housing production plan consultants consists of a three-member team that is led by uh, RKG Associates and is joined by the Metropolitan Pla Area Planning Council, MAPC, and Jennifer Goldson Associates. Uh, RKG Associates has been in business for 35 years. Uh, they have four offices, including one uh, here in Quincy, another in Dover, New Hampshire, and uh, two more in one in suburban DC and one in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, the consultant's team leader on our project is Judy Barrett, uh, who you're about to meet. Judy has uh, 30 years uh, of experience in planning and community development with a specialized uh, pr practice in housing and affordable housing. Um, the team we've selected, including MAPC, uh, notably has performed over a dozen housing production plans uh, here in uh, eastern Massachusetts. We've selected the RKG team not only for their deep experience with housing production plans, but also for their commitment uh, not just to produce a report that's acceptable to the Commonwealth, um, but uh, to help lead an intensive process of public engagement with interested individuals and groups in the community. Uh, so, uh, again, those that are watching, we hope that uh, you'll find interest in what, uh, what this project is all about and take advantage of the opportunity to participate in uh, a number of uh, public meetings that will be taking place over the coming months. Um, as with the initial town meeting article, the housing production process will seek to strike an important balance between the goals of affordable housing production on the one hand and the community expressed concerns about retaining neighborhood integrity, residential neighborhood integrity on the other. So on behalf of our housing production uh, working group, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Judy Barrett, who will share with you more about her team's work program, uh, which will be extending uh, through mid-June. 
Hey, okay. Roger, before you leave, though, um, maybe you want to get on everyone's calendar um, March 28th as your... I think that Judy's okay. going to uh, right. give you all of the dates. Yep. All right. Sure do. Okay, Ms. Barrett. Thank you. Come join us. Thank you very much. Um, I'm actually joined tonight by Jen Goldson, who uh, is, is on the team with me and was probably going to have a few words to say about the March 28th meeting, which you already um, mentioned. Um, I'm really delighted to be here, and I'm delighted to be on this team. Um, we've all worked on housing production plans in a variety of communities, and just so everybody kind of understands what this creature is, a housing production plan, um, it really consists of three key pieces. One is a needs assessment, which is what we're working on now and planning to submit a draft uh, report on the needs assessment later this week to the planning department. Um, the second piece of it is a set of goals for the community, and some of those are numeric, having to do with the safe harbor issue that I know your community is concerned about. And some of it is really around qualitative issues. If you're going to be working toward the 10% statutory minimum, what needs do you want to try to address? Which ones are the most important in the community, and how might you go about doing that? So, um, and then what types of housing types, perhaps, would you want to encourage as you're working toward those goals? And the third piece is the implementation strategies, which is really key, and it's probably the most challenging part of any of these projects, because it's one thing to say we have needs and we have these goals, it's another thing to actually lay out a path for addressing them. And so, um, that will be sort of the third key piece. Throughout this process, we've tried to provide for a variety of public participation opportunities um, you could do a housing production plan entirely off data and have a plan that no one's ever going to be able to implement, or you can do a plan where you're consulting with the community throughout and have something that's more likely to succeed. So toward that end, we do have uh, a first community meeting coming up at the end of, of the month to talk about needs and also goals, um, and Jen, I'm going to ask you to speak to that in a minute. But throughout, for all the major milestones in the project, we have continuing um, community workshops. There'll be a later workshop around kind of site selection, not so much asking people to point to parcels on a map, but rather what kinds of standards would you use to pick appropriate locations for affordable housing. Um, and then to sort of vet what locations show up based on the application of those criteria. Um, and then, of course, a look at the whole plan. So over the coming months, that's what we'll be doing. We've actually already started providing for some electronic ways for people to participate. We recently um, made a, a very simple survey available through SurveyMonkey. Um, and uh, just close that down this morning so we could use the information in the draft needs assessment. It's not a statistically valid survey, but it does give an opportunity for people to participate, especially those who may not come to a meeting. And, and one of the things that I thought the board might be interested in knowing is when we closed the survey down this morning, we had about 535 respondents. Wow. Um, and about one in every four of the resident respondents, one of the questions we asked was, do you live in Brookline or not? And some of the people who responded are not residents, perhaps they work here or, or have some other affiliation with the community. But about one in four of the resident respondents indicated that they would probably be moving out of Brookline in the next five years, and most of them cited high housing costs as a reason for that. Um, about 70% of the resident respondents said it was really important to them to try to stay here as they age, but they had concerns about whether the housing choices and the public amenities are here that would allow them to, um, to age in place. Um, we did get a fairly healthy response from tenants, uh, from renters as well. Often that's the hardest population to reach. Uh, but there were about 200, which is 36% of the resident respondents. And many of them said it was kind of unlikely that they would be buying a home here, um, and most of them cited the cost of housing, which I don't think is probably a surprise to anybody um, you know, in the room. And so we then kind of asked people if they had any thoughts on, on strategies perhaps that the town should prioritize. And the ones that surfaced uh, to the top were helping people stay in the community as they age, uh, encouraging the creation of homes to attract young professionals and encouraging the creation of homes with a mix of price ranges. So those were the ideas that people tended to sort of support. Um, again, it's not a statistically valid survey, but it does give you some insight as to how some people who are motivated enough to answer a survey feel about the community's needs. Um, and I think I would just like to ask Jen, if you want to maybe explain to the board what we're going to be trying to do on the 28th, that would be super. Yeah, sounds good. Hi, I'm Jen Goldson. Uh, and what I'd like to just go over very briefly um, is first to encourage Gesundheit, to encourage you all to come on the 28th, and I hope that you can. We'll be having the workshop in the Peer School uh, cafeteria, and I actually don't recall what time it starts. It's probably at 7, yeah. 
Uh, and so the purpose of this, this is the first of four community workshops that we'll be holding. Really, it's about one every month over the next four months. And the purpose of this workshop is to help develop goals to incorporate into the plan. And so to help community members do that, we'll be first giving a sense of what the housing needs assessment is showing. And we're developing some infographics to help folks understand some of that as well. So I think it'll be an interesting presentation. Uh, and we're going to be doing this partially in presentation mode and partially in open house mode. And so the open house mode will allow people to circulate throughout the cafeteria to different stations that will all be staffed by one of our team members. And at those stations, people can learn more about housing needs and what do we mean by this and that and how did you come up with this other thing. Um, and then they'll also get a chance to give uh, their own feedback on some of the draft goals that we'll have developed by then that's based on the housing needs. So it'll be very interactive, the first of four. And we're hoping, even though it's not a requirement that people attend all four, we are hoping that we get lots of folks who do come to all four of them. So I'm happy to take any questions, but I also don't want to take up a lot of your time. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Selectman Heller, do you have anything? Uh, no, I'm looking forward to uh, participating in the process. Yeah, as, as am I. One of the, uh, one of the, as part of the implementation plan, as I understand it, uh, part of that is identifying parcels, is it not? Yeah. That is one of the, um, the requirements, if not actual parcels, then at least areas in the community where it would be appropriate to encourage a mix of housing types. Right. So I just wanted to alert the community that, mm -hmm. that uh, that's going to be one of the outcomes here. So yep. uh, um, it's, it, it would be very good to, uh, for folks to participate. <laughs> People always like to identify parcels that aren't in their neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny how that works. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll ask a question. Um, <laughs> uh, how granular are you expecting this, um, this workshop on the 28th to get? Are we going to have a conversation about 40R, 40S, um, you know, 40 alphabet soup, or are we still at a high level? Yeah. Well, this really is at the high level, although the way we structured it, or we'll be structuring it with open house stations, it gives folks who are wanting to really roll up their sleeves and give us comments about things like that um, the opportunity to do that. Not everybody will be at that same level, so it's, it's a good setup for a mix of backgrounds and knowledge bases. Yeah, so what Selectman Franco was referring to is uh, different uh, sections of the uh, uh, state uh, um, general laws which encourage uh, various aspects of affordable housing production. Which all have their set of advantages and disadvantages. Mm -hmm. so. Right, right. Any other questions? Well, the... I have one. Ah, Selectman Heller. I have one other comment. And that is, I think it would be helpful if uh, it could be explained what happens in, in the process after this housing production plan is actually um, uh, completed, where it goes, how does it help us. I think that would be an important thing for the public to understand. That's, yes, that's a, that's a great question, and I should have covered that, and I didn't. I apologize. When we um, finish the the plan. Um, we will be bringing it to the selectmen and the planning board for a joint vote of support. The state won't consider it until both boards uh, approve. Uh, once the state has approved it, and you now have an approved housing production plan, um, then as you, uh, if you, if you do continue to approve either comprehensive permits or other ways to create affordable housing, um, if you accrue enough production in, in any given year, you can qualify for what's called safe harbor status. And safe harbor status is really a way of saying, we are working diligently toward our 10% statutory minimum. In the past year, we have created X number of units, which is this sort of threshold that you need to reach. And don't ask me what it is, because I'm forgetting right now what Brookline's is. Do you remember, Roger? 130 something. Okay, thank you, so you know. Oh, yeah. um, if you reach that target in a year, then you qualify for a safe harbor status. And if DHCD agrees, then you'll get a letter that says, you, in fact, have met your production goal. And for a year, um, you would be in a position, if you choose, to either continue to approve comprehensive permits or deny them. 
Right. So it's, it's a way to manage the, um, the volume of housing production is really what the safe harbor status is about. If you're doing your job um, from the state's point of view, if you're doing a jo your job toward production, then you get a, a bit of a reprieve. And then the reprieve goes away and you start production again. But that's the whole point. Sir. Just um, to add one, one um, additional thought to that. When you all approve, we, we hope you will end up approving the, uh, the work product that's going to take place uh, and it's sent up to the state, that does not provide a safe harbor in any hard fashion. What it does do, or what we're hoping it will do, will uh, have the, uh, in effect, the town will be sending a message to the community and prospective developers that they're more likely to receive a relatively recept receptive um, uh, uh, welcoming if uh, they, they propose development in areas that the production plan identifies as more uh, in, in keeping with the town's uh, criteria and anything that's not in that area would be receiving a less receptive plan even though there's no safe harbor. It actually requires uh, for the safe harbor itself where the town recovers the power to make its own decisions on what to approve th through the ZBA. Uh, that requires actual production, uh, the permitting of housing, not just the inclusion of particular locations in the plan. So it's very much of a two-step uh, process. So a question I have, and I don't know who would answer this. Um, so if, if out of this process by the summer, let's say, um, we, the boards uh, approve a housing production plan, can any of the current, what I'm describing as tsunami of uh, 40Bs, then count towards um, our housing production to get us certified sooner? Any production that happens pursuant to that plan would count. So if your plan is approved on August 1st, and on August 15th, the Board of Appeals grants a comprehensive permit for some number of units, those units will count toward your certification if you're eligible you know if you're it, it, it contributes to your ability to become certified and uh, does the particular parcel that gets approved has to have to be in that housing no. okay no it does not and and really I think it's part of why um, you know you, you may want to think as many communities have instead of naming parcels think about areas of the community that are appropriate um, many communities do that instead of trying to name a parcel because then people get into arguments later about, well, why was it this parcel and not that parcel? Those are decisions your, your community is well, going we'll to have to make. we'll get into arguments sooner. Yeah. <laughs> in, our, in our case, that's a good strategy. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Ms. Hamlin. This is not a question. Sorry. It's just a very minor sidelight. But uh, uh, Jen was a planner in our community here in Brookline for quite a while, and we were sorry that she left, but we're so glad she brought expertise back to our town. So thank you. glad well, to be working you. with her again. And welcome back. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. This should be a very interesting process. Okay, moving on, uh, we now have some uh, interviews for boards and commissions. Uh, first one up is uh, Dan uh, Gostin. Did I get that right? Can I call you back a while? Yes. Uh, Selectman Heller is uh, dropping off. Um, and uh, Mr. Gostin is uh, interviewing for the Arts Commission. Correct. So, so tell us uh, your interest and why you'd like to be on the Arts Commission. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the rest of the committee. Thank you. Um, I have been in kind of an intermittent resident of Brookline. I graduated Boston College in 2009, lived here 2010 to 2013, then went off to the UK to study musicology, uh, but now I'm back in the Boston area and I couldn't be happier to live in Brookline again. I really made it a, uh, an effort to come back to this community. I think it's really remarkable how much, uh, how, of course, how many resources the town has, but also the wealth of talent that is here within this, this little enclave of the surrounding Boston area. Um, and I think that a lot of the per recent programs that have really tapped into that uh, community talent, um, the uh, art projects, I mean, we see some here in the room, 
uh, also more events uh, that are happening to um, celebrate the grant recipients, uh, major grant recipients. The Poet Laureate, Laureate Program has been, uh, has been very great for the profile of Brookline, and I think that um, I would very much like to be on this commission as kind of a, mu a more musical voice. Uh, there's a lot going on with poetry and writing um, and uh, uh, fine art, uh, and I think that having a little more voice for the mu musicians in the town might be a little beneficial. But of course, I'm not just a musician, I'm generally an artist, I would say, um, and especially because of my liberal arts education, I think that integrating a lot of the, these community projects is um, imperative to survival, not just because of uh, you know dwindling money for the arts, but also uh, as comprehens a comprehensive way to bring people together. I think it's very important to um, have wide-reaching events, not just for one specific kind of uh, medium, but to bring everything together. And I think that will help the community a lot. Uh, I have past experience in arts administration uh, with the Handel and Haydn Society as an intern and then the, uh, an intern marketing assistant for them. Uh, and of course, I've been director of music and uh, ensemble managers for many things uh, at Boston College, Boston University, and at the University of Durham uh, in England, where I just was for the past two years. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Slugman Heller just rejoined us. No problem. Thank you for joining again. Um, and so my, uh, my interest in this is to really get back into the community, to give back to a community that, is, that has really fostered uh, my own endeavors uh, while a student, but also as a resident and now working here again. Uh, I work just across the street at the Starbucks here, <laughs> for right now anyway. Um, I'm still applying to other positions, but uh, I see a lot of, uh, especially visual artists, come in and that they have such great talent and I think that we really need to foster that. So I'd like to rep represent not only musicians and maybe uh, a little younger generation on the commission, but also to uh, get really interdisciplinary approaches to uh, events. Slutman, uh, yeah, well, I'm delighted to see a musician who's uh, interested in the Arts Commission because I, I think that, that, as you pointed out, it's an area that they really haven't been working in but um, could. And I wonder if you have any sort of thoughts of events or programs or something that you'd like to kick off? Yeah, I think that, well, a lot of what's going on in, of course, the city of Boston, I don't know how taboo that is to mention <laughs> things that happen over there, um, but what a lot of the smaller uh, uh, kind of uh, chamber ensemble based um, groups are doing are more private events. Um, and the Brookline Symphony um, certainly can benefit from smaller, uh, smaller either, either home events or fundraising events um, being more prominent around town, maybe during the summer, uh, to attract not only the members of the symphony, but also um, a lot of other musicians who happen to live in Brookline, but may not know that there are programs to support them. And I think uh, even my friends here that live in Brookline have no idea that the town can support their kind of their their artistry, their work. I, I think a lot of smaller groups, smaller choral groups, particularly that I've worked with, uh, would be happy to perform here in Brookline. I think getting more exposure for them is, you know, of course, beneficial for everyone. Slutman Green. Yeah, uh, give me some sense of uh, ideas you have about bringing the arts to <coughs> the uh, public schools or the schools here in Brookline. I mean, for even more so than we do now. Um, you know, what, what role do you think the Arts Commission can play to sort of as, to um, <clears throat> enhance the uh, music, uh, perf performing arts, you know, and, and other artistic forms for uh, public school kids? I think for schools specifically, um, it's very beneficial for uh, more seasoned professionals um, to come in and give workshops, to give talks. Um, and I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of people in the music community are willing to do that. They do that with Boston Public Schools. Uh, they, there's a big program at Dana Farber uh, that incorporates some early music, early musicians that come in uh, a couple times a month to play for patients. And I think that sort of thing can uh, can translate into the public school realm as well. Uh, also, I think that the univer surrounding universities can take place in this too. There are a lot of great graduate musicians. And again, some that even live right here in Brookline, whether they chose to or just because it's close to BU or whatever, but um, we can tap into that and use them as a, as a resource uh, to go into the public schools to show what these, to show the kids what um, can happen with the arts. I know when I was in high school, we didn't have a very good 
uh, music program. I'm from New Britain, Connecticut. It's a, a mid-sized city, but didn't have a lot of resources. Uh, and so a lot of kids uh, weren't, didn't get involved with music, even though they were probably interested in it. And I think that's just because we didn't have any role models that came in. Um, we don't have, the, again, the universities surrounding us, the professional musicians who live in, in Brookline, uh, like they do here. I think uh, workshops of that sort would be very beneficial. Slokman Franco? Um, one thing, uh, one comment, and I don't expect you to respond to this necessarily, um, is I would love to see uh, the Arts Commission uh, form a, a a tighter bond with some town events that take place. Um, Selectman Green uh, did a remarkable job at the Martin Luther King Day uh, event this year, uh, incorporating poetry uh, and taking advantage of some of the, the real resources we have in this community regarding um, poetry and the spoken arts. Um, we, we have not done a great job, in my estimation, tapping into the professional, the student, um, the amateur, uh, musical talents of Brookline residents and incorporating them into town events that we have. I think that's something that uh, that the Arts Commission could serve a, a great um, role in helping to, to facilitate um, and should you be uh, uh, appointed to the Arts Commission, um, it's an area that I would urge you to, to give some thought to and perhaps explore. Yeah. Slickman Heller, do you have anything? Right, as do I. Um, okay, well, so me, uh, just yeah. one thing. Uh, don't forget the elderly population here in Brookline. I, mean, I think there's a lot of opportunities to expand the exposure of that population to, you know, real quality art um, and and you know performance art and and, and other you know, artistic endeavors. So, yes, correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the good news is there are several vacancies on the commission. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So we're not going to be doing the appointments tonight, but uh, you'll be hearing from us. Excellent. Thank, okay. thank you so much for thank having me Thank you so much today. for applying. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Next one up is uh, Joan Mahan. Come join us. This is for the Commission for the Disabled. Good evening, and it's Mahan, just so oh, you know. I'm That's sorry. okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, Yes. Tell us about yourself okay. and why you'd like to well, join the commission. Um, I am a lifelong resident of Brookline, born and raised here. Um, I've raised my children here. They went to the Pierce School and graduated from Brookline High School. Um, I, in college, got involved in the deaf community and uh, worked at a school for the deaf and became a sign language interpreter. I subsequently, my third child was born with a hearing loss and she's deaf. And so I've been very involved in that community as well as a deaf-blind community and um, also involved in the public school system with the understanding what years ago was called the Understanding Handicaps Program. Then it changed to the Understanding Disabilities and now it is Understanding Our Differences. I was instrumental in writing the deafness unit. Um, at the time it was called the hearing unit and it was like, well, this is not about the hearing, this is about the deaf. So. Um, I've been involved in the disability community for many years, and um, now I have a granddaughter at the Pierce School, and I'm once again co-chairing the Understanding Our Differences program, and I am, you know, sort of back in the throes of the community, and I would very much like to see some changes made, and I think being on the commission would give me some validity going forward to places like the Coolidge Corner Theater, and asking for better um, captioning services for the deaf, um, as um, I have a friend that's lived in Brookline for more than 30 years, and she's deaf, and she has to go over to the Kendall Square Theater to go to op open caption films. Um, I know there are many devices that provide captions for the deaf, but my daughter included, they don't let necessarily want to be singled out and have the device in front of them. We all know we like to sort of meld with everyone else. Um, ironically, in Boston Sunday Globe, in the magazine section, a very lengthy article by the, um, about the Massachusetts Cultural Council. And I thought they put this very, um, they, they talk very succinctly about what they're doing and, and what's happening around the state. There, I'll read something, I want to read a quote from the article, and also there's a list of 
uh, cultural organizations that are participating um, in this new initiative that they have, and Brookline doesn't have one of them. So I think that um, the Coolidge Corner Theater may be one of the first ones potentially to um, participate in this initiative. It's called um, the Massachusetts Cultural Council's UP Inclusive Design Initiative. UP is universal participation. Universal participation recognizes that to grow audiences, institutions should improve experiences for everyone. Greater access doesn't just benefit people with disabilities, greater access benefits all people. Your friend with dyslexia, your cousin with bro the broken ankle, a child with behavioral issues, or you, tired from an afternoon well spent at the museum in search of a seat. So as we know in Brookline, I intend to go out of here feet first, and um, it's an aging population, uh, my hearing is not what it used to be. We all need access to these um, services. And I think that um, Brookline, being the progressive community that it is, can be in the cutting edge of getting a town-wide accessibility for everybody, and not just the people who, in this article, say they, they have the inability, not the disability, to do things. And as we age, we are all going to be in that position if we, um, fortunately, live as long as my mother did to the age of 94. So I would very much like to be on the commission. And I know at this juncture that they're contemplating what to call the commission. As I've just noted, there have been many changes in the language of what we call the, uni the unified, I'm not the unified, rather the understanding disabilities. So I'm not sure where the language is going for the commission, but right now it's a commission for the disabled. Is that, I'm not even sure, or of the disabled. So that's another, you know, as we know, language is very important. But anyway, that's who I am, and um, I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. There's there's hardly any questions to be asked. You've got a very clear idea of what you want to do. <laughs> so I, I actually I came from a uh, a commission for the disabled meeting earlier this evening, uh -huh. um, and I can report to you and to my colleagues on the board and to the general public that uh, we have docketed a conversation about potentially changing the name for next month's meeting. So okay. we beat you to the punch. We're, okay. we're one step ahead of you. <laughs> okay. Um, I, uh, I'll just sort of comment on some of the, the remarks that you gave uh, in your, your statement. Uh, I, think, um, I think your focus on making Brookline an inclusive place for all residents is, is right, on, uh, right on the money. Um, and uh, while the commission hasn't had a conversation about, um, about um, uh, captioning at the Coolidge Corner Theater or any other uh, facility in town, I think that, um, that those types of conversations about uh, allowing everybody in the community to access um, some of the cultural gems, the, uh, the, um, the, the other businesses that we have in town uh, is right on the money and, and sort of falls into the, the, um, the, the conversations that the commission is currently engaged in as it sort of tries to navigate its way and find uh, what its next big project is going to be. I, I have a question because I don't watch the selection meetings um, at home. But I don't know, are these, these meetings captioned? Did any, are these meetings captioned at all? Do you know? Um, do you have any kind of facility? I don't know. No. I don't I think know. we are. Okay. It's not captioned. Okay. It's not captioned. Ah, uh, okay. Um, because there's such thing as captioning at real time, a cart reporter that could sit here much as this, what this woman does. And, I, I, I and, believe and there, uh, there are lots of ways yeah, to access Yeah, the captioning things. is actually a topic that came up in our mm -hmm. uh, licensing hearings. <laughs> our our li uh, licensing hearings, and we're talking to uh, Comcast, whose uh, uh, um, license is up for renegotiation, uh, and that would, as one of the possible uh, things we we might be asking for, whether that we can negotiate that uh, is, is another story. Listening to the gentleman before me, I thought I was at the um, Dancing with the Stars uh, fundraiser. This, um, I guess it was in. I don't know if it was in the December or whenever it was. It was yeah. In, yeah. And um, there was a family who has a daughter who has cerebral palsy, and I believe that's what her condition is. And they are working towards accessible playgrounds. That's another focus right. for the commission. Um, also, just incorporating the arts in general and having people, deaf people perform beautiful art, poetry, and um, plays. Um, you have lots of different avenues which go to in, the, in, that, in that community as well. And that's just another, listening to him, I thought, oh, that's another great way to include people um, 
in this in this demographic in the in the community. Right. Let me just add that that the skill set which you've talked about this evening. Um, you know, serving the deaf community is something that's not currently represented on the commission. And I think that um, having somebody who, who um, has some experience relating to that, um, that, that community at a very personal level uh, and can help the commission provide services, service um, to uh, what is not an insignificant portion of the Brookline population is in and of itself uh, going to be a great resource in addition to, to the current roster of, of members. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, I, I want you all to know that I've known Joan many, many years. I first met her um, when she was acting as the sign language interpreter for Newton students, deaf students who came to um, the schools, our schools, to in the uh, unit on deafness in the Understanding Handicaps program as it was called then, which I was then coordinating. Um, and I've known um, Joan's dedication to uh, the topic of disabilities and uh, especially knowledge about uh, the community, the deaf community. Um, and over, over the many years, and this is even before she had a child who um, has uh, a hearing issue. So I'm um, uh, we know that she's applying, um, begged her to do it before, and she's always resisted. But uh, I think that uh, it's, it would be great to have someone of her caliber um, on the commission. And I, um, I think the issues that she's raising are very significant, and I would support um, trying to get uh, the television um, broadcast uh, closed captions, to have uh, facilities in our movie theater and other places for the community, for the deaf community. So I'm, I'm thrilled you're applying, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Mm -hmm. Any other comments, questions? Um, we're not voting this tonight, but uh, you'll hear from us. And thank okay. you so much for applying. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. Sure. And uh, next one up is uh, Lark Palermo for the Zoning Board of Appeal Appeals. Ms. Palermo? P Palermo? Palermo. It's also the capital of Sicily. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you've uh, been before us recently uh, on another, um, for another commission, uh, but I'm, I'm glad to see you're applying for the Zoning Board of Appeals, which is a very uh, important uh, uh, commission of body um, which is uh, going to be uh, un under the gun with uh, a whole bunch of uh, 40B comprehensive permits which is uh, uh, a different kind of process than the normal 40A normal zoning uh, uh, process uh, so you know the, the commission is going to have a uh, uh, a big workload over the next uh, year. Okay, don't don't scare her off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so why don't you tell us about yourself and why you want to join? Well, um, you are correct. I came before the Board of Selectmen a few months ago after having applied for the Housing Advisory Board um, and possibly the Board of Trustees for the Walnut Hill Cemetery. I would put both of those in the category of sort of dipping my toe into the water of doing civic work here in the town of Brookline. I love the town. I've been here over 20 years. I'm at a point in my life where uh, my husband and I are both empty nesters, and although I still have a full-time job and other things, I do have the time to devote to the town of Brookline and thought this would be a nice way to start that process. But unfortunately, neither of these opportunities had any vacancies. And at the time, you gave me the advice of talking with other people in the town about other ways I could be helpful, because I, I do have a desire to be helpful. And after discussing it with a few other people, including Roger Blood and Polly Selko and a couple of members of the Board of Selectmen and my neighbor, um, I think I've been convinced that I should jump into the deep end of the right. pool as opposed to dipping my toe 
into the water. Um, clearly, that's what this would be. And, uh, and um, Selectman Daly has identified my only apprehension, with, which is, you know, do I really have enough time to devote to what is clearly going to be um, an enormous workload? Because my goal, again, is to help the town of Brookline and help the residents of the town of Brookline. And I would um, be dismayed if I, if I thought I couldn't devote enough time to what is clearly going to be um, a big workload. But I have the background. I have practiced real estate law for many years. I have um, represented primarily commercial real estate developers before zoning boards of appeals. So I have, you know, good working knowledge of what that involves. Um, I worked with my own neighborhood again almost 20 years ago in um, Button Village when we had a development proposal. Um, before our Zoning Board of Appeals to um, manage the project so that it was acceptable to everyone in the neighborhood. It had been the Healy Garden Center and um, was converted to seven units of housing. Um, and I also now am involved in aspects of affordable housing. I uh, did uh, serve as the general counsel to the community um, builders, which is a nonprofit affordable housing development company and then transitioned into running this uh, charitable organization, which is Habitat for Humanity Greater Boston. I emphasize the fact that it's a charitable organization because we, we do um, the lion's share of our work with charitable contributions, um, which frankly allows us to be far more flexible than if we were using government funding. So it's kind of a luxury because we can tailor our projects to work to the benefit of the communities, the donors, the users, it's a, it's a different process than, um, than a typical affordable housing developer follows. But in any event, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you are. Well, thank you. Selectman Daly. Well, I'm, 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 and your background is very interesting and you've had the experience on the developer side and now on the affordable housing side, but also as, as you say, as an, an act of, uh, neighborhood person and so I and I, I per personally think that you know uh, obviously when you're on the Zoning Board of Appeals you have to apply the the zoning law but there are areas in, in which there is some some leeway as to how much you you know ask for from them and the um, and I, I wonder if you can just sort of ex give us a little bit of a sense of your idea of you know of what kind of balance to strike between neighborhood interests and the developers interests and well my personal opinion um, based on my years of um, service in state government is that um, when you're an appointed um, representative of the public that um, your goal is to represent the public the developers are the private sector seeking something from the public. And so um, it's, uh, in my view, in, in an instance like this, the job of the Zoning Board of Appeals is to represent the interests of the residents of the town of Brookline. And if you're uh, facing a proposal from a developer, um, your job is to get the best outcome from that developer's proposal for the residents of the town of Brookline. Mm -hmm. I, I also think um, I would love to have, and I, I, you know, I realize they're dealing with a lot of cases and maybe don't have time to sort of contemplate this, but I would love to have the Zoning Board of Appeals occasionally say to us, you know, you guys ought to think about making some changes in the zoning law. You know, here is an area that we see that there kind of been problems in how we have to administer it, or you could make this better, or something like that. Is that something you could foresee? Uh... I would not do it um, precipitously. <laughs> um, I uh, I think that it could be helpful to have data from the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Board of Selectmen to understand what issues had arisen under what sections of the code and whether there could be benefits to changing the code. But it, I would want it to be a community process as well. 
Well, yeah, it would yeah, have to be, yeah. <laughs> given that I have to go to town meeting and get a right. two-thirds yeah. vote. But some, sometimes um, what we don't... We don't always hear about what areas of, of the zoning bylaw are be, are problematic. So, uh, so it would be good to get feedback uh, uh, to us, you know, through the planning department. Uh, that, that would be a good thing. Any other questions? I think I think we're going to try to uh, make appointments in the next few weeks because we need to. Uh, get the, uh, the ZBA fully staffed uh, for the upcoming cases. So you'll be hearing Sir, from us. Can I yeah. make one comment? Sure. Neil? Yeah. Um, um, I've had an opportunity to talk with Mark and I also have, have looked at her resume and it's very impressive. Um, she clearly has a huge knowledge base um, and work, while she works in a charitable organization now, she's done a lot of uh, on affordable housing, and I'm hoping that, um, you know, we have uh, other people who apply and sometimes don't know as much, and I'm hoping that um, you would be willing to, to mentor people in terms of um, the, uh, the law on the ZBA and help others understand uh, some of the nuances, maybe hold your own in you and others hold your own mini workshops for yourself uh, on, on um, and especially the 40B law, because I do think it is pretty complicated. And uh, I don't know that we're taking advantage of all of its provisions. Well, it absolutely is very complicated, and I'd be more than happy to offer any service or information that I could to other members of the ZBA. Sure. And I'll also mention for the public, uh, um, the, the ZBA, um, the, there are some skill sets identified in the law that the ZBA is required to have. And uh, one of the skill sets is that of an architect or a builder. Um, and uh, we only have one person with that uh, background on the ZBA. And it would be probably a good idea if we can get another person. So if anyone out there um, has that skill set and has the interest. Uh, it's it's a great board to be on, and uh, it's uh, uh, it's one where you can really uh, make an impact uh, on your community. But one of the skill sets is attorney, we should right. say. So, <laughs> right. I'll try to think of some architects. <laughs> okay. Right. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you very you so much. much for applying. Yeah. Thank you again. Okay, now we're doing budgets, and uh, we'll do the finance department. I see Mr. Cirillo. So, Mr. Cirillo, you uh, missed me, uh, as usual, when I say good things about you. You're not, not in the room. <laughs> I am thrilled at the AAA bond rating once again. I know this has been uh, close to your heart to keep that up for these many years that you've, that you've worked here, and you've done a great job on that. And, Thanks to you and all the financial team. Thank you. Thank you very much. As a matter of fact, that's very new information. We've received that about noontime this today. So that's very new. The rest of the community probably doesn't know it yet. Uh, first of all, uh, I appear before you this evening to present the Fiscal 17 Finance Department budget. Uh, as usual, I like to just summarize the position of the department. Uh, and uh, introduce my division heads and uh, then uh, any specific questions you have to, to the department heads, uh, division heads, they'll be available to answer those questions. Uh, appearing with me this evening uh, in, I like to say, in the order of longevity, uh, David Giandakakis, the purchasing agent, Gary McCabe, the chief assessor, and Michael DiPietro, the controller. Uh, the finance department's had a, a good year. Uh, specifically, these division heads have had a very good year. A lot of successes across the board. Uh, I'm just going to name a few uh, right now. Uh, purchasing managed to get an extraordinary low bid on en energy prices and locked us in for a year. I'm saving a tremendous amount of money. I like to believe that David balanced the fiscal year 17 budget for the town. 
Uh, Gary is taking the point and the lead uh, in coordinating the town's uh, uh, response to all of these very difficult ATB cases. And Michael took the lead on completing the audit, and as you all know, we had an extraordinary report from that audit. So they've, the three of them had a very, very good year. Uh, the fiscal 17 operating budget is $3,171,000, which actually represents an increase of 7.83%. But in, in fact, it's, it, it is not really what it appears to be. True, the true number uh, really is a level funded budget with an increase of roughly 0.3%. The increase is the result of pulling money from other departments and consolidating the credit card fees in the treasurer's division. That represented $220,000 of the $230,000 increase. And without that policy change, Again, the budget would have gone up by 0.3%. Uh, Full-time positions, uh, same level amount, 30.4 FTEs. Uh, some of the things that have changed in the departments, of course, everybody has step increases. Uh, and I would also point out that uh, as an annual event, the Munis Financial Software always has this annual increase, so there's an increase in that. Uh, but once again, the purchasing agents balance the entire town budget and balance the, the finance department by budget by having a vehicle removed from uh, the budget from prior years, saving the town some money. So overall, uh, 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 the finance department is essentially level service budgeted. Uh, I will say, because I actually am as passionate about this issue as all of the selectmen are, uh, we've had a very good year of, 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 of hiring people, uh, and I, I have a policy that I try to hire the most qualified people. And in the last four or the last five of the six hires we made have been minority candidates, uh, and they are extraordinary individuals, uh, and I'm so happy to have them throughout the division in each of the four divisions. Uh, so we've been really fortunate in that. Right, right currently, our uh, department has approximately, uh, in a minor minority status, about 18.5% of our department uh, is in the minority status. And again, I just want to say extraordinary workers. Uh, with that, uh, I'll open for questions and have my team answer any questions you might have. So I I find it interesting um, in consolidate. You know, when, when the credit card charges were kind of dispersed throughout the town budget, it, it never hit me that it, when you added it all up, it, it's over two hundred thousand um, dollars. By consolidating it in one department and and managing it in one place, are there opportunities to 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 get a better credit card deal? Well, uh, first of all, we use those opportunities now. Uh, the individual line department does not negotiate the fees. The fees are negotiated by uh, the IT director, the deputy town administrator, and the finance director. Uh, and that has been the case since 2003. Uh, and in fact, the bills, uh, credit card bills on a monthly basis, are paid through the treasury division. Mm -hmm. But uh, we put the expenditure into the line uh, department. So essentially we're administering it, but it, it has been hitting uh, the line department's budget. The reason for the consolidation is that uh, there's really been a discussion over the last few years about our policy direction about who should absorb the fees. And I think this is a prelude to uh, a fuller discussion on that in which when you consolidate these numbers, you have a visual of what it is. In fact, this does not represent all of it. Anyway, because we, we, in our enterprise funds and revolving funds, we actually have fees in those because they're baked into the fees uh, of the enterprise funds. So uh, this represents the general fund consolidation of fees. Uh, and of course, there are some activities that the town doesn't pay fees on. We don't pay fees on real estate um, because if we paid 2% on $200 million, it would probably wreck havoc on our budget. 
Uh, and the other one is on parking tickets. Uh, as I said earlier in a meeting this morning, uh, if they do the crime, they have to do the time. They have to pay it. <laughs> and so we don't pay that fee, but all others uh, we have been paying. So, so w one of the things we had talked about was um, um, passing on uh, the fees for some, some of the programs that we're currently absorbing the fees. So for example, the motor vehicle excise tax, um, I don't think that's been implemented yet. No, it's uh, the motor vehicle excise tax was in the treasurer's division last year. The prior year was in IT. So that's another move Do, movement. But into where, uh, the town is absorbing the fees yes, there. Yes, and it's roughly forty-six, forty-seven thousand dollars 47000 Right. But it, it, it seems to me there, there are, there are other municipalities aren't being quite so generous um, in absorbing the fees, <laughs> I think. You know, it, although I've had a position, a very strong position on this for a number of years, I probably am going to pass on this one. This is, a, this is one that's going to, uh, a discussion that's going to take place over the next year, and uh, I can't add anything to that discussion. <laughs> so I won't. <laughs> I, I actually have some questions for Mr. Giannakakis. I, I, I note that you start off of some of some of what you were doing this this year talking about sand and salt, which right. we probably used uh, less than normal, I would guess. Well, I, I defer to the highway uh, department and the DPW to the actual usage. I know other years. Um, Obviously, last year and you know years with high snow. I know in talking to Kevin Johnson, uh, they still have been purchasing salt. They still have been purchasing sand. Uh, there is a an understanding that even some of these little storms, some of these icing events, uh, you may want to address those directly with the DPW as far as what their usage. But I do believe, at least my sense of what purchase orders have been cut, it is a, a lower year, obviously, than definitely last year and uh, probably compared to a five-year average because of yeah. the, the temperatures. But uh, as we all saw, I think it was last Friday, they uh, here and throughout the state, there was a, a lot of salt used in that Friday squall or whatever you want right. to call it that they had. So there are still, but uh, I think, you know, Kevin or Andy could probably give you a, a good answer on uh, the actual okay. usage of this well, year. Well, my next question, though, is about now we're at a, uh, the price of gas is lower than I can remember it being uh, since I was a kid, I think, um, and which is a long time ago. So um, are we able to um, purchase any in advance to take advantage of these very low prices and what are we, what are we, how are we handling that? We um, purchase in a consortium. I actually purchase for 10 towns, including Brookline, uh, in the Boston area. Pretty much everybody outside of Boston and Somerville, we do Newton, Cambridge, Arlington, Winchester, uh, Waltham, uh, all the way up to Woburn and uh, these the 10 communities because of our volume uh, I do the bids every year for the group uh, we've locked in prices for fiscal year 17 back in January um, it's for gasoline we're at 163 for diesel fuel 155 and for heating fuel 132 so it has been beneficial both this year and next year, uh, I, I'll be honest, last year I probably came up here and said, gee, we're at $2 a gallon. That We're not going to see that again. And yeah. a year later, here we are even seeing uh, significant reductions from there. So um, it does benefit us to uh, basically I monitor the market starting around December through there have been years when I've done the bids in, in June even. Uh, and we, out of the 15, 16 years that I've been doing this, we've only, the market has only beat us a couple of times. So that's a, a good track record, and I hope to continue it. Next year when I'm here, we might see prices a little higher. I don't know, but we've at least, for fiscal year 17, uh, done a good job at hedging uh, the price going forward. And we have partners in the, the vendor community who we respect our contracts. They will, you know, they will, uh, will deliver and, and honor those prices through the whole year till the middle of uh, calendar year 17. Is so that, that's and that's as far as you can go out? Yeah, they will not usually go more than 18 months out. So when we bid in January, we're actually looking at almost an 18-month period, even though we've, we're already locked in into this fiscal year. But yeah, we've, we've asked about doing 
two year, three year outs, the problem is the risk then becomes significant and our price delta will go up because they're gonna say, well, in, in 2018, 2019, they don't know, they can't buy uh, what they call strips from the marketplace, so it will end up costing us probably significantly more. You know, because there, but there, we are able to at least go out that that whole fiscal year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one final question. I know we're um, we're a self insurer up to a certain point, and then we get excess insurance uh, on the market. Is that? We well, basically, we have property insurance with a deductible of a hundred thousand. So we have all of our property. It's not liability, but all of our properties, the 60-odd buildings that we have in the town, the schools, the town buildings, uh, they're all insured, all listed with a value and, uh, for both the building and contents. That's reviewed every year. Uh, and we do have a $100,000 deductible, which is a fairly significant one. But when you think about it based on uh, it's not really meant to cover maintenance costs. It's meant to cover real significant uh, losses like we occurred, incurred in, in 2010, we had about a million and a half claim. Uh, and uh, last year, we we're still sort of in discussions with the insurance company about some losses that we had based on the four storms last winter. It's still, still in discussion and probing, and we'll, we'll see. We filed a claim, but we haven't had a settlement yet on that. But uh, the insurance process uh, has been, it's been reviewed by our outside insurance consultant that's over the years, every two, three years, taken a look at what we have as a program, and they feel based on strictly for the property policy, we have a pretty uh, successful and, and appropriate coverages for that, so for the building. But pretty much all the insurance companies raise their rates after the snow last year, right? They, this year, we always saw this year, the, and that's probably the unclassified budget, which comes up in a little bit, we increased the value of our buildings 3%, and our increase in premium went up 3%. So it hasn't been, we haven't seen, at least in the year that, you know, this this year that we've had for insurance, a significant increase due to that. Now, that doesn't say that perhaps the reinsurers and whatever next year may go up, but it, it takes a little bit of a lag time uh, before the actual market kind of responds to that. But uh, based on we haven't had any uh, significant losses other than the 2010 in quite a few years, um, the market uh, was pretty favorable for us for this current year. That's with a 3% increase reflecting the 3%. And on liability, the, we're totally self-insured? Self-insured, yes, mm -hmm. correct. Yeah, legal handles that, uh, any kind of cases like that around town. Correct. Okay. Stockman Green. A uh, comment for Mr. Cirillo. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, as, you, as you know, uh, the question of the racial composition of the town workforce is a hot issue in this town and frequently um, subject of a lot of misinformation. Um, so I appreciate your uh, disclosing to us the success you're, hire, you're having in hiring uh, minority candidates. Um, you know, maybe you'd like to you know, uh, tell us a little more about who's been hired. Because this well, comes up constantly in town. Um, it's in right across, the, are, are. across all, all mm -hmm. divisions. I actually brought some statistics here. Okay. I broke it down mm -hmm. by division. Uh, yeah, this comes up constantly, um, yeah. and I agree that's an important issue, but I, I yeah. people don't always want the facts. They just want... <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's... Uh, well, first of all, uh, in the... Uh, we have one African-American, two and a half Hispanic Americans, one Asian American... Excuse me, two Asian Americans, one multiracial American, uh, a, a handicapped position, uh, and we have 18 and a half female employees, including 65% of our mid-managers. Um, extraordinary people all, and I'm very delighted with them. Um, could I add something to what David said on insurance? I think it's important. Um, uh, first of all, um, you have a number of buildings that may be constructed in the next few years, including the Devotion School, which has already begun. As value, building value is added on in the future, your property insurance is going to increase. I mean, we're, we're not, when we complete these buildings, uh, we're not going to end up with the same value as we presently have. So as uh, you construct more space, particularly school space, this budget will be increasing. 
The other thing I want to point out because on the issue of liability is, uh, yes, we're self-insured, but we have the liability fund, which is out there to uh, support the community. Uh, but our best defense is we have an extraordinary law department who really wins more than they lose. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, uh, we, we don't have to use all of that money in our liability fund. I should, I should also add that there is a statutory limitation That's on true. liability for municipal governments that uh, this is always that challenge, but uh, for the most part, we do have a, uh, a limit on, on the claims that uh, can be made against the yeah. municipality. Select my Franco. Um, I'll ask, uh, ask for an update on an issue that you usually um, uh, address in your comments uh, in budget season, and that's sort of the cross-training that occurs in your, um, in your department. Um, as, uh, as we sort of uh, adopt the Munis platform for more and more functions, I'm wondering uh, if you're continuing that practice of sort of cross-training or um, the, the automation uh, of, uh, of services in the, in the Treasurer Collector's Office and the Finance Department in general uh, renders that sort of cross-training unnecessary. Well, first of all, I'm a proponent of cross-training, as you said, and the cross-training has really occurred in the clerical uh, area of the community. Uh, it primarily occurs between purchasing uh, controller and treasury divisions. Uh, the uh, clerical support staff in the assessing uh, division is at a higher level because of a, a more complicated uh, role of the, uh, the clerical person who deals with abatements of motor vehicle excise. She's a very talented individual, has been with us for a long time. Um, so we, we do cross-train. Now, uh, we, we have just this year completed one cross-training of somebody in the purchasing division and the new hire that I have in the, uh, in the Treasury division, which came on in November or December, will be starting their cross-training in the Comptroller's office and in the purchasing office in the next, in probably this month. Uh, so we want to have that opportunity. And as an incentive, of course, is when they do cross train, as per an agreement with the union, uh, these employees then could go up a full grade and uh, everybody, the clerical staff is taking advantage of that. They're willing to cross train. They have, they're incentivized to cross train and it's worked out. Any other comments, questions? Uh, I, I have a question for Mr. DiPietro, I think. Um, and it's, it's about the, the MUNIS system, and um, I, I see in, the, in your accomplishments in 2016, you completed the upgrade to MUNIS 10.5, but in your objectives for 2017, it's, you're upgrading again to version 11. And I, I frequently hear uh, from, you know, over the years, complaints about MUNIS not being able to do things. I mean, what, what are, what, what's MUNIS 11, going to give us that we don't have now and are you happy with it or or feeling that we should be shopping elsewhere or what's the status? Uh, no, I mean overall like any software system there are pluses and minuses but um, but overall I'd say from a town perspective um, it, it's very good at what it's intended to do for municipalities. They do specialize specifically in municipal government, municipal finance. Um, so overall I'm, I'm pleased with the software. Um, as far as the um, the enhancements related to version 11, a lot of it is more technical behind the scenes. It's not so much the, the front end that the day-to-day -day users see. It's more the back, the back end, the database, et cetera. So I, I don't envision uh, dramatic changes as far as the 10.5 to 11 version for the day-to-day -day users. It's more the back end um, updates. And also typically with these software packages, you kind of have to upgrade because eventually the support for the older version goes away. Uh, yeah, I was, <laughs> I was about to say that. Uh, that is true, it goes away. The other thing I, I want to point out is that the town's policy, uh, and I want to include the IT department in this discussion as well because they've really been a tremendous help to us in this, is that we, do not, we are not the first ones to go to the next uh, version. We would like someone else to test the tires before we, uh, we, we go up and step up to the next version. Uh, conversions are complicated. Uh, they are 
change is difficult in any environment and the municipal environment it's it's glacial <laughs> it's very difficult to get through so uh, we want to make sure that other communities have tested the software before we move up to that level yeah, that's a wise policy yeah. in my experience I, I have one quick question for mr. McCabe You're talking about when your uh, this is your objectives completing the development of the comparable sales mo market model within the existing CAMA system. Um, can you tell me what that is and what what it's sure. doing for us? Thank you for the question, Gary McCabe, uh, Chief Assessor. Um, the question is um, objectives for uh, 17, um, and we've listed that we're going to. Um, uh, utilize a, a portion of our software that we have. Uh, we've populated the data, but we haven't actually used the model. It's a comparable sales model. A, a comparable sales approach to valuing property is more of a single property approach that um, uh, a realtor uh, or a bank appraiser uses. They select you know half a dozen or, or so comparables and say we're going to we're going to assign a value of the subject based on the comparables. We apply more of a mass appraisal system. Um, we're, we value more than one property. We value 17,000 properties. So that comp sales model, um, property by property, isn't, isn't going to arrive at new assessments. We're going to use that to look at um, taxpayers' concerns when they file appeals. And I'm hoping um, we can take that to the website as well and say to the residents, the property owners of, of town, um, would you like to look at some comparable properties before you make a decision on whether to appeal or not? And so that's where it's headed, both for our use and for the homeowner's use, to say, you know, let the software and the data pick the comparables uh, for you. That's what we want to do. Okay. Uh, yeah. I want to compliment you on continuing to put as much uh, information online as, as you can. I think people appreciate that. Uh, thank you. Uh, as noted in our annual report, we have a map on the website now um, where all the sales that we use for arriving at our new assessments with some assessment information. I'm going to attribute uh, that in part to um, a decrease in the number of appeals this year from prior years, even with a, an override. So I, I think, yes, the more information we can put out about um, the assessments and how they were determined, uh, the better for all of us. Right. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Mr. McCabe, as long as he's standing at the microphone. Um, I don't expect a detailed answer to this question, but there have been an, a number of uh, proactive development proposals across town, both on the commercial side uh, and on the residential side. We've pontificated at some length about uh, the number of 40B applications that um, are have been filed and that are with the Zoning Board of Appeals, or, or, or soon will be with the Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm wondering if that has any impact upon your workload in your headcount. Is that something that we should be thinking about going forward, or is that really a non-event a non in, in, in your mind? Um, so like with Frankel, I think that's a very good question. Yes, the, the impact is more in how we view a property in Brookline, not the amount of time it, it takes. Uh, so I'm, I don't think there's an impact on our resource needs, either personnel or otherwise. Uh, but it does change our focus to the value of the underlying land. Um, and you know that's becoming more and more uh, clear that uh, a redevelopment um, is interested in the location and the size and shape and, and access and zoning. Things that beyond the, uh, the building, oftentimes as we've seen, the existing building is not contributing to that um, new development uh, whatsoever in, in many of these cases. So um, it's causing us to focus on more on what could be um, developed as opposed to what is developed. So, and, and that's just you know, a market um, a driven, obviously market driven uh, concept. Uh, but it's become more important for us to consider than it may have um, in relation to the existing building. Uh, 
you, know, you may have heard the Dunkin' Donuts at 20 Boylston Street sold for what I would consider a price well above what a Dunkin' Donuts would sell for. Um, so, you know, you look beyond the, the immediate use to, to some prospective potential future use of that property. So that's our, that's our shift, the, how we think about property value, not how much time, you know, and tools we need um, to value it. Is that helpful? It, very helpful. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Kleckner. Um, yes, uh, actually, I wanted to um, make a few comments about Steve. Um, and Steve is always gracious to give his division heads uh, acknowledgement, which they certainly deserve. They did have an outstanding year, but I wanted to, to make some comments about Steve Cirillo, who is, as you know, retiring from a long career in municipal government uh, this spring. It's hard for me to even say that because I've relied on Steve so much um, and will miss him so much. Uh, but uh, in fact, he is... Uh, he is leaving. He reminded me again today. That he is <laughs> leaving, and uh, I just want to say that uh, I don't know. Steve probably doesn't know this, but when I first got into municipal government back in 1981, uh, I had an opportunity to observe Steve, and uh, I think he was with the city of Newton at the time, perhaps. Uh, I was here actually. Uh, here in yeah. Brookline, and then went to Newton, and so perhaps it was a few years later. And uh, Steve has uh, um, evolved into one of the most respected and um, credible municipal finance officials uh, in the Commonwealth, but also, I think, in the country. And uh, I have, uh, the town has been really um, fortunate uh, to have him here, as, as have I. And uh, the one thing I do want to mention, I think what Steve's uh, legacy, of, among many things, will be here and in his career is um, his ability to actually take this concept of, of uh, voluntary payment in lieu of taxes and related payments and make it happen. And uh, Brookline is way ahead of the curve um, on our ability to encourage and um, uh, entice uh, private nonprofit institutions um, to pay taxes when they don't have to or pay uh, in, lieu of ta uh, pay, uh, in lieu of tax payment. Uh, we have Boston University, which by far is our largest one, but we have many and many of those, and I think you know that just uh, recently we approved a, a very novel agreement with the uh, registered medical marijuana dispensary, which wasn't a, technically a payment in lieu of taxes, but was something else. And uh, if not for Steve's um, tenacity and vision, um, those wouldn't happen. And I just want to say uh, thank you, Steve, for that. And um, I'm sure we'll have more opportunities to. Uh, Toot, toot Steve's horn a little bit. He won't do it himself, so I wanted to have that opportunity to do that tonight. Yeah, I want to. I want to add. I've I've worked with Steve. Uh, it's, it's for me. It's been close to 19 years because I was on the advisory committee right. for a number of years before I joined this board. Sure. And um, you were deputy town administrator at the time. But right. I, I think one of the tremendous, tremendous assets that you have given to the town is the the blueprint for the long-range planning and um yeah i i i think you um we are s sorely going to miss you but you have cert put a lot of um uh, policies into place a lot of um, um you know um patterns for how to look at things and and um how to how to um how to do things that I, I will serve us well. Um, what we will miss is the guy who always has the answer at the tip of his tongue and when I ask you some obscure uh, financial question. So um, we, we, will, we will definitely miss you, but I, I thank you for your many years of service to this town. You know, Nancy, most of those answers I make up, so. Oh, yes. <laughs> The truth comes out <laughs> right out of the air. Oh, okay. Well, but I'll also that shows add, I'm, I'm easily. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll also <laughs> add that um, you have you have quite a way of explaining complicated uh, uh, concepts uh, in a very simple way, to, so that uh, um, lay folks can really understand uh, uh, what's going on, and and uh, I'll miss that. Right, thank you very much. Yeah, I think, and I think Steve give, giving us some sense of what the um, actuaries are doing when they look at things is is yeah. truly amazing. Yeah. 
Communication is definitely one of your strengths and on a subject which is not always as uh, clear to some of us who sit up here and who sit on the, uh, the advisory committee um, as, uh, um, as it is to people who have professional expertise in it. Um, I want to uh, thank you and, and compliment you for your ability to connect somewhat disparate trends and uh, events in town uh, and uh, allow us to understand what is going on in its totality and make policy decisions um, and to some extent political decisions about how to proceed. Well, thank um, you. Incredibly helpful. I guess I, I'd just like to comment that, it, first of all, thank you. F uh, it's really been a pleasure working here. I also would like to say that it really is, although you're showering me with uh, compliments, it really is a team effort. And all of those issues that you brought and mention there's been a team behind it, a, a, a large team and a very qualified team on it. Also, I'd like to say that, in fact, that I've been really fortunate over the years to have a number of mentors. Uh, I, I think about when I first started here on June 20th, 1979, and my mentors, of course, were Dick Leary and uh, Ed Clasby and Jerry Hayes and Bill Griffiths, Evelyn Corain, David Turner. I mean, you couldn't have possibly had better teachers than those individuals. Uh, I moved on to Newton and I had Mayor Mann and Rich Kelleher. I worked with Rich Kelleher for 19 years. Uh, and uh, when Rich left, I was fortunate to work with Mel. Mel has invited me into his inner circle and allowed me to participate and really made me feel very comfortable about staying. So uh, I, I will miss you all. I really will. Thank you. And we'll miss you. Thanks. How do we follow that? <laughs> I'll take up your, uh, your budget. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, the selectman's budget, which doesn't follow very well. Good evening. Um, so the selectman's budget is pretty much a, a level funded budget. Uh, the increases that you do see uh, are for normal personnel costs associated with step increases and longevity. Um, the reduction in services of $5,000 just reflects the shift of credit card service charges into finance. I, I hope that Steve covered that during his review. And um, there's a modest increase in capital, um, which just reflects the current cost of lease computers. This is a very straightforward budget. It's good to see we're being parsimonious as usual. <laughs> Steps at the top. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Boy, you're going to get off easy. <laughs> well, we have, do we have more to cover? Because I, I, I think there's also other unclassified. And I don't know if yeah. Steve covered debt service or not. Uh, no, he hasn't. And so we're just waiting to see uh, whether Sean and Jones is coming up. Or um, if not, you can just keep going. They were deep in discussion. Sometimes um, in the past, they've come up after their meeting has ended. I'm That's hopeful fine. that the town council discussion will be shorter than the planning department discussion, which was quite robust. Um, <laughs> so if you turn to page 136 in your budget book, um, that is the debt and interest p uh, portion of the budget. Uh, the, uh, the debt service schedule basically um, shows that we next year will be uh, 10742938 which represents about a 1.2 million, 13.3 percent increase. Then I can go on to unclassified unless... Uh, and that, of course, is due to the fact that we've borrowed more. Correct. And, um, you know, uh, this morning the advisory subcommittee me, um, met and reviewed this budget as well. And the ramp up into uh, fiscal 17 um, next year for outstanding debt includes bringing more of the devotion project on as well. What kind of interest rate assumptions... Uh so for uh, in the outer years, um, we assume for 25-year term, 5% interest, and then it, it's lower for a 10-year term and a 15-year um, term. So the uh, for the unclassified. What's the, the devotion um, when you go out to permanently bond that though? That would be a 20-year, 20 20, 25-year, 25-year. Yep. Okay. 
and that's going to be a level debt service schedule as well. So the, uh, the unclassified section of the budget is on the following page. Um, these are accounts that are pretty standard um, for, for the town in terms of the, the out-of-state travel is under the discretion of the town administrator and generally can fund one or two trips um, for conferences and training, professional development for department heads. Um, the uh, printing of warrants, town meeting report, uh, these are the budget books, the combined reports, the, uh, the effort that's needed to support town, me town meeting. Um, MMA dues, MMA is our lobbying uh, group for, uh, for any statewide issues that we, we need some assistance with. So these are um, it dues for the town specifically. Um, there are individual members that also have dues which are in the selectman's budget. Uh, for general insurance, um, David talked about uh, an increase of about 3% for our um, property insurance that we have. Um, if there are additional questions about the details on those plans, I can, I can follow up with him as well. Um, audit and professional services, $92,000 uh, is for the audit and uh, professional services is for $45,000. So that $7,000 increase that you see is, is related to the audit. Um, for professional services, we had talked about some of the planning studies that will be funded out of this account and then um, some of the town administrator's initiatives that he spoke to in his budget message um, with regards to performance man management and diversity as well. Um, the contingency fund, I think you are all familiar with uh, the contingency fund. It basically helps with some of the um, incidentals that are required of uh, the selectmen in terms of um, some meals for the meetings and then also um, various um, expenditures that happen that are kind of one time in nature. The uh, liability cat catastrophe fund, this is a, um, an appropriation the, that is recommended based on the fiscal policies which recommend 1% of prior year net revenue. Um, the increase there that you see of $65,000 is primarily related to prior net revenue increase because of the override funds. So that's why there's growth in that budget um, as well. Uh, the affordable housing trust fund is also uh, based on a formula when the housing trust fund falls below five and a half million. Uh, an infusion of free cash is also um, added to the fund after we've covered our reserves and covered the 6% um, policy under the CIP. Um, the stabilization fund, there's no recommendation for an appropriation because it's at the required level per our fiscal policies. And the reserve fund um, is also based on a 1% of prior year net revenue formula, which 75% would come from the property tax and 25% coming from free cash. Yeah. Yeah, most of these are formula driven mm -hmm. and those policies have served us well. Mm -hmm. And is a big reason for our uh, AAA bond rating. AAA bond rating, exactly. Right. Questions, comments? You're getting off easy. <laughs> I can. Um, I'll check and see if we can send somebody um, well, back we upstairs. Can, uh, but you can probably. We can talk about the uh, 40B, uh, 40, 40 Center Street. Sure. <clears throat> So let's, let's move on to uh, item 10 on the calendar, the 40 Center Street um, uh, letter, which has gone through a few revisions. Uh, um, we have in our packet a, uh, a draft, uh, which in, by my review of it, um, kind of reflects, I think, what we heard uh, last week at the public hearing. Certainly beyond that, it reflects the comments that, uh, that uh, I had. Um, uh, this, I, I just noticed, I just looked down and noticed a typo. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I, know, I did too. <laughs> um, the, second, the second line of the second paragraph, March 1, there should be a space. Ooh, page, are we on the page? One. Page 1. Oh, I think there is a space. It just doesn't. But I'll certainly correct that. Maybe I have an old version. Yeah, I don't think there is a space. There. Yeah, the, you need a space. It doesn't look good. If that's the worst of the comments, right. you're doing pretty good. 
<laughs> and the one, the one I found is one of the bullets isn't lined up. Uh, Selectman Daly. Yeah, I just I left you a message. I don't know if you got because it was very. It's like five o'clock, so I apologize. But um, the only the thing I you were talking at one point about um, the setbacks, um, and you did say allow for more landscaping. But I thought one of the comments we heard from people and was particularly as to the front setback. And um, it, that building kind of coming right out to the street and it being a very busy street that people walk along and now there's some trees there and this, it would be um, um, for, you know, for a busy pedestrian area, having that building come so close um, to the sidewalk. I thought that deserved maybe a little mention um, in and of itself that, that when you're talking about setbacks, just an extra sure. sentence to Last, yeah, particularly focus on that front um, setback because I think for the neighborhood, um, that's that's a, a very important one. Yeah, I'll, I'll just mention some of the key points uh, for the for the viewing audience. Uh, uh, we're commenting on. Um, uh, tearing down an attractive uh, circa 1921 Georgian federal revival style brick building, which is very attractive um, as a um, uh, violation, if that's the right word, of uh, smart growth uh, principles, uh, which encourage the reuse of existing structures. Um, we're commenting on the uh, um, I think uh, egregious uh, lack of uh, parking uh, to accommodate the, uh, the the proposed units, and and suggest that either the parking be increased or the project be uh, scaled back. Um, we're, we're commenting on the massing and the height being inappropriate to the site, uh, and requesting that there be uh, increased uh, setbacks and uh, um, uh, using um, architectural techniques to reduce the impact of the, of, 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 of the massing. Uh, we're also commenting on the uh, possibility of restricting the tenant pool to uh, uh, people of at least uh, 55 years old because uh, uh, this area in particular is, is, is an area that's really suitable uh, for that population given the availability of uh, shopping right nearby. Uh, it's a very walkable neighborhood and also it's uh, proximity to the senior center which, which is very, very close, uh, only what, two, three blocks away. Um, plus we're commenting on the uh, uh, lack of any usable open space uh, for, for residents. Um, and I think that's pretty much in line with uh, the comments uh, we heard at the uh, public hearing. Um, any? Yeah, I just want to make, Green. Yeah, <clears throat> I just want to uh, note that um, make sure you have the right version of this. Um, there are some changes uh, late on, late this afternoon, uh, and in our packet. The original version, right? Has the been pack that we received, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll just add that one of the other issues, uh, which we don't uh, provide a solution to, but ask for more information about, is another issue we heard at the hearing, and that's the issue of traffic and um, and uh, trips generated. Uh, it's one of the bullets, uh, I think, on the third page of the letter where we're asking for um, a, a traffic and parking <coughs> circulation study. Um, so certainly asking for additional information about the the impacts. Yes, that yes, the right. Will have. Yeah, I see it. And we're also asking for a shadow study, staking uh, on the lot, uh, stormwater drainage report, uh, a few other odds and ends. And the only reason I brought it up is it was the topic of some conversation last week, um, and I want to make sure that um, everybody who's watching knows that we're not neglecting that that important issue. Right. We're not taking public comment. Uh, sorry. Um, any other comments? So, any requested changes, or is it ready to? Well, I, I just request the change that I mentioned a few minutes ago. 
Right. And so fresh. I'll incorporate those changes and prepare them for your signature Thursday? Yeah, I'll be around. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm not going to look for any more typos. I'm sure I can find. <laughs> you always find typos if you look. Um, but I just want to say this is a very, uh, I think, a very good letter. It's clear. It's persuasive. Um, it's not necessarily going to carry the day, but, you know, it, it, it's a really good shot. So, Thank you. Yeah. Unfortunately, you may see another one very soon, similar to this on 420 Harvard. Right, and the public hearing for that one is next week? Next Tuesday. Yeah, and that's the last one that we know of in the immediate pipeline, right? That's the last one pending bef before the state at this point. Right, wow. And for those of you who may not know yet, uh, appeal was issued for 1180 Boylston. So I anticipate an application for a comprehensive permit very soon. Have there been any changes to the project yet, especially in the parking on that one? Not that we know of. Okay. That, the, I'll be curious to see how they solve the parking issue there. That, that parking especially was problematic yeah. in, in, in that project. Um, okay, uh, we're done with the, so I, I guess uh, we have to take a vote. Um, so I'll vote that we execute the letter to Mass Housing regarding the application of uh, 40 think, Center Street as I think amended. our vote needs to be to authorize you to sign the letter substantially in this form with the suggested changes tonight. Okay, that sounds like a good motion. Thank you, Ms. Lachman Daly. You have that, uh, Kate? All those in favor of uh, Selectman Daly's uh, motion? Sele Aye. Selectman Daly. Selectman Franco. Aye. Is Selectman Heller still here? Aye. Okay, thank you. Do you have any, I'm, I'm in the middle of the vote and I'm asking you, do you have any, <laughs> do you have any comments that you want to add? I'm sorry. Um, I'm just pleased that uh, the letter does stress the issue of uh, carrying back on of that lovely uh, Thank you. And Selectman Green, your vote? Um, yes. Okay, and the uh, chair votes aye. So uh, we have. I'm sorry, aye. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's okay. I understood yeah. that your, your, your vote, and I'm sure uh, Kate did too. So uh, thank you, Ms. Thank uh, Steinfeld. You. Um, and this is the first uh, stage in a long, first step in a long process, so there's plenty of opportunities. Uh, um, down the road to influence the design. Um, th here we're trying to influence the state's uh, approval. So uh, yeah, but the the everybody who's watching, and I think we have one interested party here in the audience, um, should ke keep uh, abreast of when this comes before the zoning board of appeals, because that is definitely your opportunity to talk to the specifics of the project and. Right. Um, what do we want to do? Do we want to uh, do the appointments? Uh, do we want to talk about the advisory committee budget, or do we want to wait for them I, to? I think, uh, you know. Uh, it's a pretty it's, straightforward it's, it's budget. Really, it's here, actually, yeah. They're, it's, they're it's, here every Tuesday, so uh, I'm guessing they probably would want to have an opportunity to come up. But um, It's only a 1% increase, then. But, but let's do the appointments first, and maybe they'll show up. Okay, well, um, Mr. Chairman, there are two uh, commission boards and commissions up for appointment on the docket this evening. The first is the Bottled Water Study Committee, and um, I know Selectman Green has uh, identified some potential candidates for this, uh, this committee. Um, there are seven in total, and so I'm going to uh, read them off uh, in, the, in the order that I have them. Can I make a comment? Uh, remember last meeting, um, the issue was raised as whether the committee had sufficient diversity. And I, um, I was asked to 
um, expand the uh, committee to ensure that there's uh, additional diversity. Uh, so in addition to the four people who applied, and I think that you know, this committee can handle the, the number of public uh, members that we have here, uh, so I accepted all four of those. Uh, but also I added uh, three women, um, uh, Leah Cohen, who's um, a local business person um, and who uh, is uh, very interested in this issue and, and I think would be a very good uh, addition. Uh, Jane Gilman, uh, who is uh, involved in environmental issues in town uh, quite intensely and I think would make it, not, again, a very uh, good addition to the committee. And uh, a, a third person who's kind of new, well, not really new, um, but um, uh, Crystal, uh, Crystal Johnson, who's, a, uh, who's involved with environmental matters uh, quite extensively. She's an African-American woman. Um, I, I've met her, uh, and yeah, I think that uh, she would be a, a good addition to the uh, committee also. So we're, we're talking about seven people. It's a large number, but the way the, the uh, committee is, is set up, um, I think that you know, it can be handled. We, we, I talked to Alan Balson this afternoon. We, we have a work plan as well as identified people uh, on town staff who can handle uh, uh, compiling data that can be presented to town meeting uh, pursuant to the warrant uh, article. So I think um, you know, we're, we're ready to go and, and uh, I think we have a good outcome. Okay, Mr. Kleckner. All right, so I'll, I will read this and listen to the vote. Uh, Leah Cohen. Aye. Aye. Andrew Fisher. Aye. Aye. Jane Gilman. Aye. Aye. John Harris. Aye. Aye. Patrick Kessock. Aye. Aye. Nate Tucker. Aye. Aye. Crystal Johnson. Aye. Aye. Thank you. And uh, the, um, the uh, board's uh, committee for the, uh, uh, the camera, surveillance camera oversight committee uh, has uh, one applicant um, to fill a vacancy, and that would be Harry Chevriot. I heard I heard sufficient <laughs> number of votes there. So so that concludes the board's appointment. I, I guess I would say that um, you know we'll see if the uh, advisory committee wants to come up. They're they're here every Tuesday night, literally right, this right, right. time of year. So I don't think that's yeah. Happen. That is uh, if 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 they elect uh, if if it becomes difficult um, to get them here, given that we have concurrent meetings, I would feel comfortable with that particular budget. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. It's yeah. a very straightforward sure budget. Yes. Yeah, the, the only issue is whether there's sufficient money for their uh, evening meals. <laughs> yeah. I think that they've got plenty. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Wouldn't want them to be starving down there. Uh, right. They might okay, that uh, concludes this selectman's meeting for Tuesday, March 8th. Have a great rest of the week.